Hey, welcome back to my channel and welcome back to learning more with me. My name is Yogi Aaron and I am the Stop Stretching Police. <laughs> of course, this is just a little bit of fun that we're having because my whole shtick is about stop stretching. So if you followed the last video, one of the things that we covered was how someone from the flexibility research had kind of written a counter argument to a post that I made about why you should stop doing passive stretching. So we kind of covered some of his points in the last video, but in this video, I want to get into it a little bit more and cover some of his other points and talk a little bit about what he is saying and why he is not correct. But before I do that, I want to just kind of make one big point here that for a lot of people, the idea, and I get it, the idea of letting go of stretching is really scary. If you're a fitness teacher who's been teaching people to stretch, 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 all of a sudden to kind of admit that maybe you were wrong or maybe that it was actually hurting people can be kind of threatening to your sense of self and sense of ego and and sort of your base of knowledge. I am a yoga teacher. It took me years to kind of like let go of this idea of stretching. Uh, one of the articles that I was reading, and I'm gonna come back to it again in this video, um, was written in 2008 in the New York Times. I think it kind of came into my purview around 2015. And by this point, I've already been having issues in my body. I was dealing with chronic pain as well as many other issues. And I had already started to veer away from stretching so much. I did stretch, but it wasn't as intense as I used to do it. And it started, this article kind of opened my eyes. And of course I did some further research into it. I started to realize that perhaps stretching wasn't the way to go. But here's the thing. I was a yoga teacher. I am a yoga teacher. And the idea of letting go of stretching really scared the crap out of me because I was like, what am I going to teach if I'm not teaching stretching? And to be honest with you, I've actually had several conversations with very senior yoga teachers who basically said the same thing to me. I don't know what to teach people if I don't teach them stretching. So the idea of letting go of something that we really cherish as truth is very scary. So let's take a look at this post uh, that this person made and we're gonna continue on from where I left off in the last video, if you want to go back and watch the other video, it was really good. And we're just going to continue on looking at some of his points because I think that he does raise some good points, but they're also worthwhile talking about. So one of the things that he says is it to my claim that passive stretching disrupts our brain muscle connection. That is a fact. And I actually addressed this in the first video, but I also kind of want to just verbally explain what's going on. You have in your muscles called, the, the very tiny fibers called muscle spindles. And muscle spindles are like um, little tile, <laughs> little coiled up slinkies. And these coiled up slinkies, what are they meant to do? They're meant to stay coiled. But when they sense that they need to contract more, they send a message to the brain uh, and they say, hey, we need to contract, and the brain sends back a message and says, okay, contract, and then they go into a contracted state. So an example of this, when this might happen or when you might need this to happen is when you're bending over to pick up your groceries um, or you've dropped your keys and you wanna bend over and pick them up. So there's a lot of muscles that have to be contracting in order for you to pick those up. If they're not contracting, the body is still gonna move that direction. You're still going to be going from point A to point B, but now you're starting to recruit muscles that should not be doing their job. But going back to what we were talking about a moment ago, when these muscles sense, these muscle spindles sense that they need to contract, they send a message, hey, we need to contract, the brain sends back a message. Now, if that telephone line between the muscle spindles and the central nervous system is not working properly, uh, which is a very good possibility, 
then that messaging doesn't happen. And just as I said in a moment ago, that your body is going to recruit, your brain, your central nervous system is going to recruit whatever muscles it can to get you to bend over, pick up those bag of groceries or those keys and stand back up. The problem is, is that if those muscles aren't working properly, it's going to recruit other muscles. And that's where we start to get into problems. But there is ample evidence. You can watch it in the first video. I talk about this kind of, um, um, literally the muscle to brain connection or the muscle to central nervous system connection. And what happens is, is that there's gamma motor neurons that are stimulated and that's what starts to send the message. Now, when we stretch, when we stretch, that literally gets cut off. Those, those intrafusal muscle fibers become desensitized and do not produce those gamma motor neurons. Thus, the communication system between the brain and the muscles gets cut. So another way, or let's kind of bring it down to something that most people can understand. If you've got a telephone line between your brain and your muscles, when you stretch, it's like taking a pair of gardening shears to that telephone line. And if you're kind of stretching because you're gonna go do some exercise, you're gonna go work out, you're gonna go to the gym, you're gonna go for a run, I don't think what you wanna do is take a pair of gardening shears to the telephone line between your brain and your muscles because you need that connection so that when your body senses that, or your brain or your central nervous system senses that you need to use those muscles, it's got somewhere to send those messages, right? So there is a lot of evidence out there, but one of them I wanna circle back to here which is this um, article called Stretching the Truth. And I did go through this in the last video, but just in case you missed it or need a little refresher, if you're like most of us and we're taught the importance of warm-up exercises back in grade school, you've likely continued with pretty much the same routine ever since. Science, however, has moved on. Researchers now believe that some of the more entrenched elements of many athletes' warm-up regimes are not only a waste of time, but actually bad for you. The old presumption that holding a stretch for 20 to 30 seconds, known as static stretching or passive stretching, uh, primes muscles for a workout is dead wrong. It actually weakens them in recent studies conducted at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, athletes generated less force from their leg muscles after static stretching than they did after not stretching at all. Now, what I can tell you is two things. Number one, if I tested, manually tested a muscle on you and it was strong, and then I asked you to stretch that muscle, or stretch one of the groups of muscles around there. For example, if we look at the uh, hip flexors, we made sure that your psoas was really strong. And then I got you to do a passive stretch called hugging the knees into the chest. And I got you to hold that for about 30 seconds. If I came back and tested your psoas, it would test weak. If I tested a thousand people, it probably would test weak on 999 of them. I've actually never found anybody that stayed strong after this test, and I would be hard pressed to find somebody that would. Why? Because as soon as you passively stretch, you take that gardening shears to that telephone line between the brain and the muscles. This guy is saying that there's no science around it. There's a lot of science around it. And starting with the science of, I can actually test you, but you can also do your own tests at home. You can do things where you test your own muscle strength and then you go and stretch it and then you go back and test it again. Um, it will always test weak. You will notice a huge difference as soon as you start to passively move uh, muscles. A muscle loses its force output. Let's kind of jump ahead a little bit here and this is one of the main quotes that I really like to pull from here. There is a neuromuscular inhibitory response to static stretching, says Malachi McHugh, the director of research 
at the Nicholas Institute of Sports Medicine and Athletic Trauma at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York City. The straining muscles become less responsive and stays weakened for up to 30 minutes after stretching, which is not how an athlete wants to begin their workout. Now there's one more study that I'd like to just share with you and you can go and find a lot of different studies like this on the internet. But this particular study was a comparison of assisted and unassisted proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation techniques and static stretching. But the point that I want to actually make here is that basically they were doing this study they were looking at different um, ranges of motion and the effect of different kinds of stretches on the system. But I want to kind of jump to like the last uh, sentence here. Thus, individuals can implement uh, PNF stretching techniques with a partner or alone with a strap to improve range of motion. But athletes should not use these techniques before important competitions or training because of the impairment of limb velocity and MT. And so one of the words here is proprioception or proprioceptive. And so proprioception basically means that there's a connection between the brain and the muscles or the central nervous system and the muscles. And what stretching does is well, let's kind of back up one second, just to kind of imagine that the brain or the central nervous system has an understanding of where muscles are in space, and space is your body. When you stretch, you start to move a muscle beyond what its capacity is. So a muscle can lengthen to a certain point, and by the way, it can lengthen because of what the opposite muscle is doing. So if I bring my hand towards my shoulder, the bicep is going to contract. But in opposition, the tricep is going to lengthen. That's pretty cool, eh? So when we talk about dynamic stretching, what we're really saying is improving the contractibility of the bicep so that the tricep has more capacity to lengthen. If we want to lengthen, for example, the hamstrings, stop stretching the hamstrings, start to improve the contractibility of the quads do some isometrics to improve the quads ability to contract and contract on demand, more specifically the rectus femoris muscle. But when we go and stretch, if I was going to stretch my hamstring, all of a sudden the brain loses that proprioception. Not only does it not know where the hamstring is in space, but it also doesn't know where the quads are and it actually begins to have a detrimental effect on all of the uh, hip flexors as well. So I'm not, I'm pretty sure that's not how you want to go into an exercise. This post, has just opened up so many cans of worms. There's so much to unpack here. Um, I just love talking about this stuff. This is only slide two. We still have a few more to go, so I'm gonna come back in another video and tackle this a little bit more. Until then, stop stretching, start activating, and don't let the stretching police come and find you and give you a ticket. <laughs>